When a computer network goes down or stops functioning, the first step in troubleshooting, or one of the first steps in troubleshooting, is to do this one thing. So you've got a perfectly running, smooth, humming network, everything is working fine, and then all of a sudden everything stops working, you've lost connectivity to entire buildings, entire areas of your network have stopped working, people have come just short of maybe throwing babies out of burning buildings. It's gotten to this point, and it's gotten to this point really fast. So what is the first step that you need to do? What is the first thing that you need to do to determine what happened to cause this chaos? When a computer network goes down or stops functioning, the first step in troubleshooting, or one of the first steps, is to start checking log files on any or all devices that are around the problem area. Now, when I say the problem area, I mean after some initial triage troubleshooting to determine if the problem is localized on the network. Is it in a certain building? Is it in a certain connection? A specific area of the campus? That type of thing. Then you want to go start going to those devices. So let's say you've determined a connection between two buildings on your local area network stopped working. You'll want to look at the log files on the switches, routers, and other devices devices in and around that connection point. So what are log files? Well, most layer 2 and layer 3 switches and routers, as well as servers and the operating systems running on those servers, have systems set up to automatically log entries into what are called log files, or syslog files. Now, these log files are saved to the RAM memory, and in some cases long-term memory, but most of the time into temporary RAM memory, and these log files show any changes to the previous states on that device or that portion of of the network. What does all that gibberish mean? Well, let's take a layer 2 switch for example. Most layer 2 switches, most brands of layer 2 switch, have the capability of holding 200 to 300 log file entries for any changes or issues they experience or detect. Examples of changes or issues would be an interface that was up and connected, suddenly going down or losing connectivity. A loop being created on that portion of the network, and the switch detecting spanning tree BPDUs arriving on a different interface than the one they were sent out on, a large number of new MAC addresses being learned, a port doing what's known as flapping, it's going up and down, up and down, the actual physical switch or router if you're looking at its log files, overheating or experiencing a sudden large bottleneck of traffic that cannot be processed consistently, traffic is jamming up on these interfaces. We could go on and on with this list of state changes that are recorded into the these log files. The point we want to get to here is that one of the first steps you take in troubleshooting any computer network issue or issues is to start logging into the switches and routers, and yes servers and the operating systems on those servers, and viewing their list of log file entries where changes were detected and recorded into those log files. Now checking log files can seem a little bit tedious and in a way it is. But just keep in mind that you're not going to be doing this all the time. It's not 24 hours a day or in an eight hour workday or anything along that line, it is only typically when something goes wrong on the network and you're trying to determine what did the switches and routers and servers detect occurred. In fact, it's somewhat rare that log files have to be looked at when everything is working correctly and your network is humming smoothly. It's usually only when he or she is attempting to get to the bottom of what caused issues on the network that those log files really need to be viewed and more closely looked at. Really quickly, if you are logged into a Cisco switch running iOS and you're using the command line interface, to see the log file entries you simply enter show logging and hit enter or show log for short and hit the enter key. Again, 99% of the time these log files are only stored in the temporary RAM memory of the switch or router. So if the switch or router you managed to log into lost power or rebooted at some point, it will only have log file entries since it powered back on. Those that were entered before it powered off or lost power are lost. This can be bad and very unreliable, especially for troubleshooting. Therefore, you need a way to keep a longer record of those log file entries for short-term research of what may have occurred on the network. Enter the syslog server. Admins and technicians can set up what are known as syslog servers on a computer network typically on a server, but I've seen these on laptops and desktops as well, where switches and routers can not only record their own log file entries into their own RAM memory, but they can send the same log file entries across the network over to a syslog server in the case that the switch or the router loses power or connectivity for any number of reasons. This provides a secondary location for those log file entries for reference, and it gives the admin or tech another better 
longer term storage of the log files for review. Now I'll get into some other details on setting up the clock and date on switches and routers to confirm those log file times and dates match with actual time and day. I'll also upload some more videos showing exactly how syslog servers can be set up for use on a network. For now just remember that switches and routers and yes many servers as well will automatically create entries in their own log file or files anytime a state change is detected or a loop or a connection is lost as well as a myriad list of other changes detected. These are among the first things admins and techs will look into when something on the network isn't working.